Hello, everybody. Uh, Lisa Monaco, welcome. Thank you. Thank Great you to be for, here. for bringing up the rear. We're glad you get the grand finale and the last word today. Um, before I dive in, I, I should just acknowledge the last question uh, that was uh, one of the last questions was actually got, um, how should we put that, deferred to you. Do you want to weigh in on the question of Turkey and Fatula Gulen and the prospect of drone strikes? Um, well, I would rule out the prospect of drone strikes inside the United States, so let me assure the questioner on that score. Um, but uh, what I will say is we've been working with the Turkish government and responding to their request for information and we'll continue to do that. We've got an established process which is run by the Justice Department uh, to work with their legal counterparts in other countries uh, for their request for legal process and that's the process that's going on now. All right, there we go. Um, so Lisa, we just heard her title, Assistant to the President for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism. I mean, but that actually makes you as the president's chief counterterrorism advisor. And I don't know who came up with the name for our session, but we're down to talk about the presidential <laughs> daily brief, so I figure we should run with it. Sure. I think it might be interesting to people to get a little bit of a glimpse of how that actually unfolds every morning. So let me ask you to paint us the picture. Like, Take sure. us inside the White House. Where are you? What time does this start every day? So. Um for me, the day starts uh, earlier than the President's Daily Brief. So the President's Daily Brief is both the name of the book, now it's an iPad, uh, that the President and his senior national security team, myself and every member of the National Security Cabinet, uh, receives every morning. Uh, and it is also the name of the meeting that occurs. And it occurs in the Oval Office. Uh, so what it means for me, as it does for Susan Rice, uh, who's also in the meeting and others. How many people are in this meeting? Please? So it begins with a briefing from the Director of National Intelligence, mm -hmm. Jim Clapper, or mm -hmm. uh, his deputy, Mike Dempsey, or perhaps Stephanie O'Sullivan. Um, and uh, then also in the room is the Vice President and his National Security Advisor, Susan Rice, myself, Avril Haines, the Deputy National Security Advisor, uh, and then Dennis McDonough uh, often joins the meeting and uh, a few other folks, depending on what the topic is. So like a dozen-ish plus? No, l yeah. less than that. Okay. You know, there's a half dozen folks in, in the room for this. Um, and it begins with a um, discussion and a briefing from the Director of National Intelligence about the overnight reporting. Uh, what are the threats we're watching? Both um, immediate threat streams uh, that we might be concerned about, as well as strategic pictures. What do we think is happening in the world? Uh, what are the things we're most concerned about? And, uh, but it begins for me a lot earlier. And yeah, where are you getting your information from? Do you get a sneak peek of the I do. Uh, so I get uh, a copy of this book, along with a whole bunch of other uh, things in the book, whether it's different intelligence reports, in addition to the basically articles that are prepared for the president. So that is the president's daily brief, uh, five or six articles uh, that are prepared uh, for him and his advisors to look at. But also in my book, as in the other members of the national security team, in our book is a whole set of other reporting. Mine is tailored to, as you might imagine, counterterrorism and homeland security issues. But as I think we'll probably talk about, that is a very uh, wide span of issues. So it begins with me receiving that briefing myself from um, a member of the intelligence community who is assigned to brief me every... And what time is that happening? So that happens, it depends on um, what's going on in my schedule, usually around 8 o'clock, but I have uh, arrived earlier and I'm digesting uh, the book itself um, and looking, in, uh, looking at questions that I might have of my briefer, things I might want uh, to raise separate and apart from what's in the PDB with the president that morning. And so I spend the first several hours of my day in, I would add, a windowless office. So it's very nice to be here outside. Um, We're seeing happy to some, spring you. Some, yes. uh, some actual rays of sunshine. So I begin that in my office in the West Wing, um, on the ground floor of the West Wing uh, at the White House, which is actually just a little bit under uh, and catty corner to where the Oval Office is. 
Uh, and I'm in there reading the book, looking at what uh, has transpired over the evening, looking at a number of issues, whether it's policy issues I want to update the president on, threat streams, things we're doing about the threat streams, other issues that I want to use that time with him to raise uh, those issues with him. So spend a, hour, a few hours doing that as well as having other staff meetings. And mid-morning, it depends on what the president's schedule is, uh, I will go upstairs outside my office to a short staircase that goes right up to the Oval Office and um, meet with the president in the Oval Office along with the people that I mentioned. And that meeting can last anywhere from half an hour, 45 minutes to an hour, depending on what's happening uh, in the day. And one of the things that I've noticed in the three and a half years that I've been hmm. in this job and doing this um, meeting and this uh, kind of series of preparations every morning is A, the just expanse and wide array of issues that are both covered in the President's Daily Brief and that we are talking to the President about. And one of the things I've noticed is there's an increasing uh, amount of that um, briefing and the issues that I'm raising with him. I am regularly obviously talking to him about terrorism threats. I'm regularly talking to him about homeland security issues of all stripes. But increasingly, um, over time, I have raised with him regularly in that meeting cyber threats. So that is as well as emerging infectious disease um, so uh, challenges. So it's taking up more of your time and attention yeah. now than three years ago. So it is, it is a very robust part of the homeland security side of uh, the title that I have in addition to the counterterrorism one. Sounds robust. It sounds like an incredibly stressful way to begin your day. Every, I know it it's is, your job, but it's it sounds never like, dull. It sounds like you're facing a final exam every single morning. It is true. I've described it. It's like, and I was a prosecutor for many, many years, so it's like going before a tough judge every day. You've got to know your stuff. You've got to be prepared for hard questions. You have to have thought through um, what is it that I think he needs to know? What is it that he is going to want to know? Most importantly, what are you doing about it? Yeah. What are we doing about it? Are we doing everything possible to keep the American people safe? That is his beginning, middle, and ending question. Can you share any of this, the headlines from this morning's PDB? So it's a lot of things that you might imagine. Um, we're constantly focused on the threat that ISIL poses. Uh, what's going on? Um, a lot of uh, a lot of information in the PDB, without obviously getting into the specifics, will be tailored to meetings the president may be having, um, issues he may be confronting. So uh, he is now wending his way back from a nine to ten day trip uh, in uh, in Asia. So there will have been a lot of material in addition to whatever uh, very timely or threat intelligence we have. There will be strategic pieces uh, that uh, the president is digesting about um, uh, the issues he's meeting on. Right, and the leaders he's meeting and all that. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I mention two words that I'm guessing came up more than once uh, mm -hmm. this past summer in, the, in these morning sessions, and mm -hmm. those words are cyber mm -hmm. and Russia. Mm -hmm. Was Russia behind the DNC hack? So look, this is what I'll say. Um, first, good try. Uh, <laughs> I'm not done. Yeah. Um, look, there is a, a very active and ongoing investigation, as I think people know, and as I have expressed, as the president has said, and as I'm sure people on this stage have said before today, I'm not going to get ahead of that. What we know, though, and I have said this, and others have talked about this, Russia, along with other uh, capable state actors, are continually trying to intrude upon our systems. That's government systems, that's private sector systems, um, that's public systems not in federal control. Um, so they are an increasingly aggressive actor in this space. That is also true of China and Iran, et cetera, as well as non-state actors. The DNC hack and other uh, issues that have been very much in the news is an example of the uh, evolving cyber threat that we have confronted. I've just talked about how we've been looking at this uh, over time and things like the PDB. What we're seeing is an increasingly uh, sophisticated and diverse set of actors. So nation states, non-state actors, criminals, hacktivists, terrorists, and an increasing set of sophisticated and varied techniques, and uh, an increasingly wide 
a tax base. John Carlin just talked about the Internet of Things. That gives malicious actors a very wide, as the cybersecurity experts talk about it, a tax surface to go after. Um, so it is a, um, an expansive threat that we're facing, which is why we have placed this at the very top uh, of our priority list. And, uh, but unlike in the counterterrorism space, we have got to rely on and work with the people who own, operate, house, and administer those systems. And by and large, that is not the federal government, that's the private sector. And you've just added some nuance and reminded us of the complexity, which, which I appreciate. If I can return to the original question, though, mm -hmm. Jim Clapper, mm -hmm. the DNI, just showed a little bit of leg. Uh, in fact, a lot of leg, I think mm -hmm. you could arguably say. He said, Russians hack our systems all the time. Mm -hmm. You're willing to go that far? Yeah, and I think it's, it's also what I just said, which is, um, they are one of the more capable and more aggressive actors uh, in, in cyberspace, including against our systems, and the president has talked about this. Should the U.S. respond? So, yes, the U.S. should respond. The question is how. And what you have seen is we have adopted an approach on this, which one says we're going to be driven by the intelligence, we're going to be driven by what the FBI, the intelligence community tells us has happened. What is it that we can uh, uh, explain? You, take the Sony hack. It's a very good example of this. How can we both attribute that activity, um, show what it is we know, so that we can um, make very clear that we're calling out these actors. And then what we do is we have a full set of tools and responses that are on the table for us to look at and make judgments about. And what the president has said on this score is our responses in this space on cyber issues will be proportional. This is very consistent with the approach we've taken across the board. They'll be proportional uh, and they will be done in a time and place of our choosing. Uh, and some will be seen, some will not be seen, some will be diplomatic, some will be military, some will be intelligence, some will be law enforcement. Um, you saw, we just had John Carlin up here. Uh, he's the head of the National Security Division that I had the privilege to lead before coming to the White House. And when I was in the National Security Division, we began an investigation uh, into the uh, hacking by five members of the Chinese military into private systems to steal uh, intellectual property. That then became public um, about a year and a half ago, uh, and that was, in one sense, a response that we are signaling we are going to call to account and we are going to impose costs on those uh, who would hack into our systems and steal our intellectual property or attack our criti critical infrastructure. And why choose to name names there, but not, in this case, this summer? So I guess what I would say to that is I challenge the premise, right? Um, we have undertaken to call out Sony, call out uh, North Korea North with Korea. regard to the Sony hack. Uh, we've done so with regard to China. Uh, we also have um, done a great deal of good diplomacy with China and setting up a, a agreement uh, with them uh, that came out of the meeting with President Xi last fall. Um, but there's a lot of dancing around Russia. Why? Well, so I guess I, I would, again, I'd challenge the premise of that, which is to say, I have just said, Jim Clapper has just said, yes, they are trying to, and the president, most importantly, has said, they are intruding in our systems um, uh, all the time, and we are, one should not assume that we are not responding. I guess that's what I would, uh, I would leave it at that. Are we responding? I think we engage with uh, uh, the, on a whole host of levels, is what I would say. Diplomatic, um, law enforcement, intelligence, military, uh, on, uh, on these actors, whether they be China, whether they be um, non-state actors, whether they be terrorists. So uh, the point here is we've got a framework. Uh, we have a set of tools that we use. We have the intelligence that comes forward and the investigations that are done. Um, but people should not assume that if they're not seeing it, we're not doing it. And I take the point that there's a value to not having everything you're doing be telegraphed immediately mm -hmm. to a general audience. But isn't there a value in responding in such a way that the U.S. doesn't look weak? 
<laughs> you know, the, I, I was uh, getting asked in the corridor out there about the, the Russia and hacking question and saying, is the U.S. getting its butt kicked? Because mm -hmm. that's what it seems like if you just follow the daily stream of news. Yeah. I disagree with that, right? I disagree with that. I think the fact is of the matter is we have, and the president uh, said this, I think, just a few days ago, we have far greater capabilities, offense, defense. Um, uh, that is known. We make that known. Um, and uh, I think all experts would agree um, cyber, uh, cyber responses don't always require or cyber actions don't always require cyber responses. Sometimes there will be other responses. We've got a whole set of tools that we are absolutely willing and able to use. The question is, how are we doing it? How are we um, communicating that? What is proportional? All of those conversations go on uh, on a daily basis with regard to a whole set of threats that we face. And just quickly before I change the subject, uh, you referred to it as an ongoing investigation. Is there a time frame? I think you should talk to the FBI about that. Is, do you know, can you put any detail on what piece of information it is that they don't have that would allow attribution? No. One of the things I did when um, I came down uh, the street from the Justice Department to the White House is I took off my prosecutor hat, and there is rightly um, a, a separation on that. So they'll conduct their investigation, and the intelligence community will do its job. So. All right. Um, we're going to have time for a quick question in just a second, but let me um, ask, I don't want to let you go before asking you about Guantanamo, because mm -hmm. we've spent, we've heard a lot this morning about the radicalization process and how to prevent radicalization, and I want to ask you about the other end, mm -hmm. people who have been radicalized, people who have been in Guantanamo, are you going to get Guantanamo closed before President Obama leaves office? So. Um the president talked about this just this morning, so um, no greater authority on that than him, which is to say we are continuing to work it and he is continuing to work it. Um, what we have done is... But do you think in your heart it's possible still in the months left? I think it's entirely possible to uh, engage constructively with those who right now um, uh, have made this a very difficult thing to close Guantanamo. Um, and Talking about to, Congress. Yeah, we've got a number of restrictions, um, uh, but we have been working uh, with Congress on those restrictions, on still transferring safely, securely, because that's the number one priority, um, transferring these individuals uh, pursuant to security uh, uh, restrictions and agreements with the receiving countries, and that's what we have continued to do. Right now, there are 61 detainees still at Guantanamo. That's down from 272 when the president took office. Um, and uh, there's a number of uh, individuals there who are still uh, approved for transfer by a unanimous uh, view of the president's national security team. That's going back uh, a number of years to 2009 when we conducted a very careful review that was led by career prosecutors, intelligence, military, uh, and other officials across the government. Uh, and so we are working away at transferring detainees securely, humanely, because that's the top priority. And but within the White House, is the goal still realistically to get this done by next January? Or is it kind of an unspoken, that would be nice, but if we could get it to 25, that would be... That would be good. The, the president's been absolutely clear. He is committed to continuing to work this, to transfer everyone who can possibly be transferred. As he said this morning, um, it also, this is a, a very big ticket item when it comes to the budget. There is uh, an exceptionally large amount of money that is going, uh, that is being spent on this 400 plus million dollars a year uh, to continue uh, to detain uh, detainees, 61 detainees at Guantanamo, and um, a whole um, a fleet of our military personnel uh, who are working there uh, to do this. So, uh, as the president said this morning, at a certain point, uh, you get down to a uh, such a relatively low number, and you're continuing to spend those funds. I think the um, uh, what he would say, and what he has said, is the American people uh, should be uh, focusing on that, and Congress should be focusing on whether that's the right expenditure of our resources. And is that, and if you have questions, please get your hands up. We're going to have <laughs> lightning round one or two. So get your hands up and we'll get a mic to you. I, I guess what I'm driving at is what gives you hope that something 
that you can close Guantanamo in the next, whatever, four months, mm -hmm. when the president hasn't been able to do that in the last eight years. So, I mean, do you, what do you see that's going to change? Well, um, one is our ability to have um, transferred so many people over the last, particularly over the last three and a half years. That the years, cost that the ratio cost, becomes um, uh, insane. You know, it is it is a real mismatch. Um, and the fact that um, it does uh, continue to impose real costs on our engagements with our allies, many of whom are very vital partners when it comes to counterterrorism. Quick question right here. Yes, sir. Uh, Kevin Hanretta, uh, 15 years later, uh, are you encouraged by the direction and the progress that the intelligence community has made under the director of national intelligence? Was that the right decision to bring that community together? I am, uh, and I think it was. And I think Jim Clapper has done a tremendous job uh, because he has focused on what the mission of that office is, which has been to integrate. That has been his kind of watchword and his mission. And I see under his leadership and his team uh, a real value. When they come to the Situation Room table, we ask the DNI for what is that community view. And I rely on it when I uh, chair meetings of the Deputies Committee or, in my case, of the Principals Committee of the Homeland Security Council. And there, the fact that there's one place to look and say, give me the community view, the best judgment of the entire uh, intelligence apparatus, there's real value to the policymaker uh, in getting that. All right, Lisa Monaco, Assistant to the President for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you.